Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and today we are moving on to the second part of lecture 14 during which we're going to be looking at the late Paleozoic development of North America and the other continents at that time. So uh, today we're going to be focusing on the Devonian, the Carboniferous and the Permian. So what happened, what's going to happen in the late Paleozoic? Well in the early Paleozoic it was a relatively peaceful period in terms of the geology of North America. In the late Paleozoic, however, things are going to get a lot more complicated. So late Paleozoic sediments reflect continued fluctuations in sea level and variations in climate. So we're going to see Laurentia move slightly away from the equator and that's going to have a bit of an effect on its climate. We're also going to see uh, the changes in global sea level that occur uh, that occurred on several occasions which were related to the formation of large scale glacial, glacial events. And we also get some major continental collisions, and eventually we get the formation of a new supercontinent right at the end of the Paleozoic. Okay, so let's start with the Devonian. So during the Silurian, the northern portion of the Iapetus Ocean closed, and Baltica collided with Laurentia. So if you remember, Laurentia essentially is modern-day North America plus Greenland. And Baltica is Northern Europe, essentially most of the Scandinavian countries, plus a portion of Western Russia. And at the time, those two pieces of continental crust had a body of water in between them called the Iapetus Ocean. During the Silurian, uh, that body of water was slowly destroyed as the oceanic crust subducted. And that meant that Baltica and uh, Laurentia eventually collided, and that collision occurred during the Silurian. But it wasn't a, a complete collision in one go. Initially, the northern portions of Baltica made contact with Laurentia. And so what's going to happen as you move through the Silurian and into the Devonian, this collision is essentially going to continue in a southerly direction. And so the end of the orogeny is, only occurs when the southern portion of Baltica finally hits uh, Laurentia. So during the Devonian, this southern portion is going to close. And that essentially is going to lead to this collision between Laurentia and Baltica, but also importantly attached to the southern margin of Baltica is the microcontinent Avalonia. So the southward zipper-like closure of the Iapetus produced strong compressional and shear forces, which caused, uh, causing, which caused frosting and folding, and also the development of several large strike slip faults along Laurentia's east coast. So essentially this meant we built up a very large mountain range in orogeny uh, caused by the compressional forces and then also some of those stresses were transferred down what is now the modern east coast of the United States by a few very very large strike slip faults. So this collision with southern Baltica and Avalonia and Laurentia produced the Acadian orogeny the, that orogeny was further complicated by the fact that at the same time a few island arcs also went and collided with what is now the modern day uh, east coast. At that time it was the southeastern coast of Laurentia and that added additional complexity to the situation. So we had a few other uh, orogenic events occurring during the Devonian as well. So over on the west coast we have the antler orogeny and on the northern, what is now the modern day uh, northern margin of North America, we had the Inuitian orogeny, also referred to as the Ellesmere orogeny. So the Inuitian orogeny was probably the result of a collision between the northern margins of Laurentia and maybe a small piece of continental crust, some kind of random microcontinent. However, there is the possibility that could maybe have been due to the uh, continent of Siberia coming relatively close to the northern margin of Laurentia and producing some uh, pretty, you know, some producing some deformation. Although the two pieces of continental crust never actually hit each other properly, but in all likelihood, it was probably just a little, you know, piece of continental crust that was floating around just happened to hit the northern margin of Laurentia, producing the Inuitian orogeny. So we also get the erosion of the Caledonian and Taconic Highlands during this period. So if you remember, the Caledonian orogeny was the result of the collision of the northern portion of Laurentia and Baltica. So that produced a set of mountains called the Caledonian Mountains. 
And if you also remember uh, what in the area which is now the modern day uh, east coast, we also had the formation of the Taconic Orogeny, where we had several island arcs uh, hitting what is the, now the modern day east coast, producing the Taconic Highlands. Now, both of these areas of uh, raised crust underwent very significant amounts of erosion, producing lots and lots of clastic sediments, which were transported by major rivers across the continents of uh, both Laurentia and Baltica. Now, they were uh, they essentially formed two distinct sequences. Uh, in Baltica, what is now modern-day Europe, they form a sequence of sandstone, or dominantly sandstones, called the Old Red Sandstones. And on the Laurentian side, which is now the modern-day North America, they form a sequence of sandstones called the Catskill Delta. And in terms of the climate during the Devonian, it was most, mostly stable. It was pretty warm and pretty dry, hence the fact that most of the uh, clastic rocks that were being formed in this area had a distinct red colour to them. You remember a red coloration in clastic rocks is often a hint that they formed in arid or semi-arid conditions. So for the majority of the Devonian, the, the, the uh, climate was stable, relatively warm, relatively dry. However, towards the end, we see global temperatures decrease, and we see the formation of larger glaciers on, uh, forming on Gondwana. Now, at that point, Gondwana is situated approximately over the South Pole. And we also see the formation of some alpine-type glaciers, so mountain glaciers, along the eastern margin of Laurasia, essentially where we have this collision between where we, where we have the uh, Caledonian Mountains and the Taconic Highlands. So this is our situation. So uh, this, uh, towards the end of the Silurian, very early Devonian, we have Baltica making contact with uh, what is now what is Laurentia, and that's going to form the continent supercontinent of Laurasia. Now, the collision itself wasn't a complete collision at one time. Initially, the collision started off here in the northern portion, and it steadily worked its way towards the south. Now, at the same time, well, not just a little bit earlier than the Caledonian erosion, actually, we had the collision of what is now the modern-day eastern seaboard of the United States with several island arcs, and that produced the Taconic Highlands down here. Both of the mountain ranges that were produced were eroded, producing large scale, uh, large quantities of sediment that were deposited over the plains of Laurentia and the plains of Baltica. Now, as you head into the uh, Middle Devonian, well, during the Middle Devonian, we have the collision of the southern portion of Baltica down here with Laurentia. Now, this southern portion is mostly made up of the microcontinent Avalonia. So Avalonia consists of parts of Ireland, the United Kingdom, and a few other bits of uh, northern, uh, northern and Western Europe. Now what happens is, is when, uh, when Avalonia makes contact with Laurentia, it produces large-scale deformation in an area focused between, about, between approximately Newfoundland in Canada and New England in the United States. So that leads to the formation of a second pulse of mountain building in that area especially, and that's termed the Acadian orogeny. It's mostly focused up in this area around here. Now what happens is some of the stresses from this orogeny do get transferred along what is now the modern day east coast, and they're transferred down the modern day east coast by several large strike slip faults, a bit like the San Andreas fault we have on the western coast of North America now, you know, cutting, essentially dividing California. Obviously, then we have additional complexity added to the Acadian orogeny by the fact we have several volcanic islands also making contact with you know the modern day east coast of North America, you know, at approximately the same time. That helps to really, you know, make things far more difficult. By the time we're into the late Devonian, we have obviously the collision between Baltica and Laurentia is now fully complete. We have essentially the pretty much the end of the Acadian orogeny is now over, so we form the Acadian Highlands, which are mostly focused up here in this kind of as I said, in this area between Newfoundland and uh, New England. And over here, we also have the Ellesmere orogeny taking place on the north coast up here. You can see in the model we have this little piece of continental crust uh, moving southwards due to this subduction zone here, and this eventually makes contact with the northern, well, what is now the northern margin of North America. And this is more a kind of a global perspective of what's going on. You can see uh, this is Laurentia here, uh, 
modern-day North America. Here we have Baltica, over here. Now, Avalonia is going to be located somewhere around here. And so the initial collision starts up here, between Baltica and Laurentia, and it steadily worked its way southwards until eventually Avalonia makes contact with Laurentia. So this portion up here is the Caledonian Highlands. And then the last portion of the closure between Baltica and Laurentia, that's where Avalonia hits and Laurentia, produces the Acadian Highlands, which are focused mostly down here. And then, as I say, some of those stresses get transferred along the coast here by a few very, very large strike slip faults. We also have the formation of the Ellesmere orogeny up here, so should I say the Inuitian orogeny up here. And we're also going to have another small orogeny over here on what is the modern day western side, western coast of North America, which we term the Antler orogeny. Now, you'll notice not much else is going on. Siberia is up here, Kazakhstan is over here, China is over here, not too much to report there. It's all about what's happening with Gondwana at this point. You'll notice the Gondwana has been steadily moving southwards. So throughout the Ordovician and the Silurian, it was moving over the South Pole. And by now, the vast majority of Gondwana is sitting directly over the South Pole. Now, this is going to have very major implications for global climate during the Carboniferous, which we'll, which we'll discuss in no, now. So, all right, so during the Carboniferous, what's going on? So, Gondwana continues to move over the South Pole, and this leads to the formation of some very extensive ice sheets. And the advance and retreat of these ice sheets are going to either lock up or release large quantities of water. That water will, of course, go into the ocean basins or you know, not be able to return to the ocean basins. And, of course, that will then lead to large-scale uh, sea, le sea level rises and sea level falls, which will lead to global transgressions and regressions. So we get a lot of sea level movement during the Carboniferous related to these glaciers. So as Gondwana continued to move in a, north, in a northward direction, it began its early stages of its collision with Laurasia. And with the initial collision starts off with the, essentially the meeting of several of these volcanic island arcs with essentially what, you know, what is the southeastern and southern portion of Laurasia. Okay, that's going to be the early stages. And of course, we are going to start seeing the, uh, the, the broader deformation of this entire area as Gondwana starts to move closer. All the rocks in this region here start to begin to deform even before the impact between uh, Laurasia and Gondwana actually happens. This entire area here will have already been extensively deformed, you know, due to the compressive tectonic forces produced by the impending collision. So we're going to see Gondwana is going to rotate a little bit clockwise as the collision progresses in an approximately northeast-southwest direction. So when the collision actually occurs, it's going to initially occur around here, and then it's going to steadily move down towards the southwest. Once again, it's not a complete collision in one go. The initial contact is made somewhere around here, and it's going to steadily move towards the southwest. And this is going to produce three distinct regions. So there's going to be the Hercynian orogeny, which takes place. Now, that's in Europe only. That's where the initial collision takes place. That's then followed by the Appalachian orogeny. That's focused along the uh, eastern seaboard of the United States in the region which we now call Appalachia. And we're also going to have the Achetan orogeny along the south coast of the modern United States. That's going to be focused mostly in the Texas, Arkansas, um, Oklahoma region. That's a, that's a much smaller event, but nevertheless, it, it is quite important. And we're going to see uh, frosting and folding during the final stage of the collision, and that's going to form the Achetan Mountains, say, in Oklahoma and Arkansas, and with a little bit in Texas, and they're going to be forming in the late Carboniferous and into the early Permian. So this is our situation in the early Carboniferous. So to begin with, Gondwana has now begun to make full contact with Laurasia, so that means we end up with a set of mountains forming here in what is now modern-day Europe. This is going to be the Hercynian orogeny, the Hercynian mobile belt. Then we have a formate, the, we have uh, additional mountains forming here along the modern-day eastern coast of North America. That's going to be the Appalachian mobile belt. And then we're going to have the formation of several a small mountain range down here. This is going to be the Achetan mobile belt. At the same time, during the early Carboniferous, late Devonian to early Carboniferous, we are going to get the impact of a, a few small island arcs over here, 
on the uh, western coast of Laurentia, and that's going to produce the anthler orogeny. Now, as we move into the late Carboniferous, we can see that the collision between Gondwana and Laurasia is now pretty much complete, and we have a continuous mountain range that stretches from Europe all the way through the eastern seaboard of North America and into what is now the, the southern states. We can also see at this point we have uh, large rivers crossing a, a large plain, and it's during this period where we're going to have sea levels rising and falling quite quite quickly. You know, due to these you know glacial retreats and glacial uh, expansions. Now, this means that the coastal areas in this region are constantly being inundated. You know, they're constantly being covered over by seawater and then exposed, covered over, exposed, and that leads to these coastal regions becoming very, very swampy. And uh, and this means we have the perfect conditions for large-scale coal formation, and so we begin the formation of extremely large coal beds, especially in this region here, you know, in areas like Pennsylvania and in areas like Western Europe. We get the formation of these very, very big, very, very substantial coal beds. So elsewhere during this period, we get Kazakhstania collides with Siberia and the resulting landmass moves towards Laurentia's eastern margin. So it starts moving towards the eastern margin of Laurentia, which essentially is the eastern margin of Baltica. And this is going to eventually lead to the formation of the Ural Mountains. We should also note that uh, during this period we have large coal basins developing in eastern North America, Western Europe and the uh, Donets Basin in the Ukraine. And these basins sat near the equator in an environment that had a near constant climate. And we know it had a near constant climate because where we find fossilized trees within the coal seams, we actually notice that they have no tree rings. And that would suggest the climate was relatively stable. You know, there was no real winter or summer. And we also see the southern ice sheets will continue to grow during the Carboniferous and they will extend uh, significantly into the temperate zone. So they'll reach latitudes of about 30 to 60 degrees. So that, that's, that's a pretty substantial ice sheet that's developing over the South Pole at this point. And of course, this is going to have a very, you know, very major implications in terms of global sea level. But it also provides the glacial evidence that uh, Wegener used as part of his theory of plate tectonics. So here we go, this is our situation during the Carboniferous. We have the early Carboniferous up here and the late Carboniferous up here. So what you'll notice is by now, over here, Kazakhstania and Siberia are, are joining together. And they're going to head in an easterly direction and eventually they're going to start making contact with what is the east coast of Baltica. And that's going to start forming the Ural Mountains, which is, a, you know, the formation of the Ural Mountains, which is occurring right here. Uh, what else is going to happen? We're also going to see China is also going to start moving towards Kazakhstania and there's going to be a collision there. But most of what's going on is focused here between Gondwana and Laurasia. And you can see that as Gondwana moves towards Laurasia, initial contact is going to occur here in what is modern day southern Europe. And that collision is then going to continue in a southwesterly direction along what is now the modern day east coast until it reaches an area which is now the modern day kind of southern states of the US. And you can see by the late Carboniferous, we have a complete collision now. We have Gondwana is now fully in contact with Laurasia, and we have a continuous range of mountains going from the Hercynian Mountains here in southern Europe, or should I say in central Europe, central Europe, all the way into the Appalachians of the east, eastern coast, and into the Achete Mountains of the southern states. You'll also see we still have the leftovers of the Caledonian orogeny exposed up here. And of course, you, can, you can't really miss the fact that during this time period, you'll see we have very extensive ice sheets across the South Pole, over, you know, covering over what is now, well, what is now, what then, what should I say, was Gondwana. So what's happening in the Permian? So during the Permian, the, the formation of Pangaea was complete. So the, the addition essentially, so the combination of, you know, of Siberia with Laurasia and Laurasia with Gondwana, of course, forms a supercontinent that we refer to as Pangaea. And that was complete by the Permian. So the position of the western portions of Pangaea are pretty well constrained. However, some questions remain about the uh, number or shapes of the various terrain that comprise the eastern half of Pangaea. So 
if we just jump to this diagram here, we know very well what's happening over here because these are areas that have been studied for a very long period of time. In terms of what's going on in this region, as you can quite clearly see, you have lots of very small pieces of crust moving around. You'll have lots of you know small subduction zones and lots of you know small uh, divergent plate boundaries in this region, and it's going to lead to some rather messy tectonics in that area. And so our idea of what's happening in this region is a little bit fuzzier. So uh, we may notice that Siberia never makes it to Pangaea 100% during the late Paleozoic because we're also we're not 100% certain of the relative positions uh, with respect to Siberia at this point. Once again, if we go over here, you'll see Siberia is just kind of hovering off to the side of Pangaea. It's not really making full contact. You know, that's debatable. Does it make full contact or doesn't it make full contact in the Permian? You know, that's a bit of an uncertainty as well. But nevertheless, it, it, we know approximately where it is. So the supercontinent was surrounded by numerous subduction zones and that resulted in a net movement of Pangaea approximately northward. So in terms of North America, what do we see? Well, by the early Permian, we can see pretty much the Caledonian Mountains, which are running along here, are on the whole pretty much fully eroded away. They're pretty much gone. You can see the Hercynian Mountains, the Appalachians and the Achetan Mountains are also in the process of being eroded away. They're actually nowhere near as advanced as they well, as as, as uh, big as they were during the Carboniferous. You'll also see that we have the formation of several basins within what is a, again a relatively hot and dry climate. So North America and Europe and also some portions of Gondwana began to get covered over by you know arid and, and desert conditions. And so this meant the formation of you know several large restricted basins in these regions which led to the formation of very, very large deposits of evaporites. So uh, Pangaea itself was obviously surrounded by one very, very large ocean uh, that was called uh, Panthalesa. And this uh, ocean circulated freely. It meant that water, because there were no continents in the way, water could move from the equator and circulate up to the poles very, very easily. And this led to a very efficient circulation. That meant warm water was taken from the equator and moved up towards the poles and cold water was brought down towards the equator to be warmed up with, you know, minimum fuss. And so this meant that the uh, ocean was far more homogenized than it was, than it is now. Essentially, it meant that you would have had much warmer temperatures in higher latitudes. So this would have obviously led to a much more, you know, temperate climate. So the formation of Pangaea and several mountain ranges had climatic consequences with the core of Pangaea becoming arid to semi-arid. So if we think of a very, very large continent like Asia, well, when you, uh, the further you go from the coast, obviously, the less rain you receive. And so if you go into the center of you know, a very, very large continent like Asia, what you'll notice is in the middle of Asia, there's a desert. There's the Gobi Desert, which is, you know, covers an area of you know, approximately Mongolia. And so this is a, this is an area that receives relatively little rainfall due to its distance from coastal regions. And so exactly the same thing happened in the case of Pangaea. You had essentially the core of Pangaea was a very, very long way from the sea. And as such, it received very, very little rainfall. And so the core of Pangaea became pretty dry and was mostly covered in desert or at least semi-arid conditions. We also see that the Hercynian, the Elegahenian, which is part of the Achetan orogeny, and so oh, sorry, which is part of the uh, Appalachian orogeny, and the Achetan orogenies essentially are steadily produced to uh, will, uh, will actually sorry will form a rain shadow that will also have helped to essentially inhibit uh, where water was deposited. So as you can see, the Hercynian Mountains, the uh, Ach the Appalachian Mountains, and the Achetan Mountains here form a continuous band, and that's going to have a, a serious effect on the movement of uh, the air in the atmosphere. And so obviously that's going to dictate where moisture is taken. And obviously in some cases, if, if the moisture is coming up, let's say from the southeast, and it's moving towards the northwest, well, when it hits these mountains, the air obviously has to rise to go over them. As it rises higher in the atmosphere, it's going to cool down. As it cools down, the water in the air is going to condense and it's going to fall as rain. And so this means that most of the most of the precipitation will t would take place in that you know, if you, you take that model to be correct, 
most of the precipitation would fall on the southern margin of the mountain range here and by the time the air made it to the other side it would be quite dry and as such you would get much less rain falling in this region over here so just remember you know whenever air has to pass over a mountain range typically it gets you know it cools down as it goes up and so it deposits water in the form of uh, rain or snow as it try and you know as, the, as it rises and it cools down and so this means by the time the air makes it to the other side of the mountain range it's typically quite dry and that will mean the climate in this area will therefore be quite dry so we also get the movement of the coal fields that were focused down here essentially in this band which covers you know Europe and all the way into the eastern states of the US we see these coal fields migrating from this region here because this region starts to become a lot drier and so we see the migration of these coal fields to higher latitudes to this region up here okay and this is just simply in response to the fact that we have this nice free circulation of water so warm water is coming from the equator circulating north towards the north pole in this case and that means the ocean temperatures up here are nice and temperate and so that means you have a nice climate up here nice warm wet conditions for the formation of large-scale coal deposits in these higher latitude regions and so this is our general situation. You can see it here. We now have Gondwana has made full contact with Laurasia to produce the supercontinent Pangaea. We have this continuous range of mountains going from Europe along the eastern seaboard and into the southern states here. We obviously have Siberia. We have the formation of the Ural, the Ural, the early Ural Mountains, which is going on over here. And obviously, as I said, what's happening over here in you know in this area is a little bit more difficult to uh, to quite get a handle on. We have lots of small pieces of crust all moving around, all banging into each other. Okay, so what's happening in the late Paleozoic in North America? Well, do you know what? We'll discuss that after you guys have had a quick break. So it's been uh, over twenty minutes now. So once again, pause the presentation. Get up, have a walk around, go and get a glass of water, and please come back in a few minutes. Okay, so during the late Paleozoic, we can see we have uh, a number of orogenic events, and we also have uh, three sequences, more accurately, two sequences. So as we move into, as we move from the Silurian into the Devonian, we have the formation of the Kaskaskir sequence. So that's another event where North America gets nearly fully inundated. There's a very, very large scale marine transgression resulting in the inundation of a very, very large proportion of uh, Laurentia. And after that, we then have a retreat. And that's then followed by a very, very large um, um, marine transgressive event, which produces the Absaroka sequence, which, as you can see, is a very substantial uh, transgression that occurs over a very very long period of time and that also results in the uh, the inundation of a very very large portion of Laurentia. Now you can also see that we have uh, the Antlerogeny taking place on the west coast of the modern, well the, should, I say, should I say the modern day west coast of the United States. Now that's as you can see is, the, is a one-off, it's the only orogeny that actually occurs on the west coast whilst over on the east coast you can see that it's you know pretty much all go you can see we have the uh, now this conic erogeny is taking place during the early paleozoic that's finished then that's followed by the acadian erogeny the achetan erogeny and the allegahenian erogeny and all of these combined essentially add up to give us the appellation erogeny all right so let's start thinking about the kaskaskia sequence so the Kaskaskir sequence was deposited between the Middle Devonian and the Middle Carboniferous, and it unconformably overlays the earlier Tippecanoe sequence. So if we look at our diagram here, we can see the Tippecanoe sequence occurred down here in the you know in the Ordovician and late in late Ordovician, early Silurian. Then there's a marine regression. Most of the Laurentia gets exposed. And then as you move into the Middle Devonian, we can see we had the start of a marine transgression that reaches its peak essentially in the early Carboniferous, or should I say the Mississippian. So as with the Tippecanoe sequence, the basal beds of the Kaskaskir sequence consist of a very well-sorted, very mature quartz-rich sandstone. 
and this quartz rich sandstone was formed by the erosion of the uplifted detrital sedimentary rocks so lots of cambrian and protozoic rocks that were uplifted as part of the uh, tectonic and uh, caledonian orogenies they also have additional sediment provided by the, the formation of the early appalachians so the acadian orogeny and then it's also sediment being added from the erosion of the Archean crust of the Canadian Shield. So there's lots of sources of sediment for the formation of these uh, sandstones at the base of the Kaskaskia sequence. So the lack of sand in the underlying Tippecanoe carbonates suggests that the source regions for these sands were not exposed during the carbonates deposition. When you think about it, that makes sense. So in the upper portions of the Tippecanoe sequence, we have lots and lots of limestones. And those limestones are pretty much clastic sediment free. There's no sand size class mixed in there. And so that suggests there was very little detrital sediment being added into the sea at that point. So uh, what this means is, is, um, is that it, when the uh, clastic sedimentary rocks of the Kaskaskia are deposited, well, clearly that means you have new sources of clastic sediment that are now exposed that weren't exposed during the tip canoe. And it also means that some portions of the Tippecanoe were probably uplifted that, and the limestones of Tippecanoe were eroded away, exposing the sandstones as well, that were part of the Tippecanoe sequence, which could also then be eroded and reworked to produce sandstones as part of the Kaskaskia. So the Kaskaskia sequence, uh, Kaskaskia transgression, so I say, was very large and it rapidly formed a shallow warm sea uh, during which, once again, carbonate deposition dominated. So as you can see, this is a very generalized diagram of what was going on. So we have the Ellesmere Mountains up here. We have the Caledonian Highlands over here. And we have the Taconic Orogeny, which essentially turns into the Acadian Highlands down here. Now, all of these are going to be eroding away very, very rapidly, producing lots of sediment. Okay, And that sediment is going to be essentially deposited along the, along the coast here. And once that sediment has been deposited and it's it's can't you know it's out of the you know it's removed from the water, it means the water in the rest of this empiric sea is going to be very very clear, very very you know very very high quality water, and so it's going to be absolutely perfect for the formation of carbonates. We're going to have lots and lots of reefs in this area, and that's going to lead to the formation of a lot and a lot of limestone. So in areas of where this platform, this carbonate platform here, uh in areas of the, of the platform where the basal sandstone was not deposited, there was no proximal, because there was no proximal source of clastic sediment, the base of the Kaskaskia sequence consists of carbonates that are nearly indistinguishable from the Tippecanoe carbonates. So in some areas, the Tippecanoe sequence finishes, and then the next layer of rock that comes straight over the top of the Tippecanoe sequence is another limestone. There's no sandstone or mudstone there. And so you have a problem in that you have the, the Tippecanoe limestones directly overlain by the Kaskaskia limestones. And so that can make it quite difficult to actually work out where the boundary between the two sequences actually occurs. So you can only actually separate the two sequences using fossils. So you know, using the fossils, you can work out which sequence of limestones you're actually looking at. So the majority of the Kaskaskia uh, sequence carbonates uh, also have some associated evaporites in there and they um, they are you know, typically continuous all the way through the uh, the Kaskaskia sequence. There are a few exceptions. Uh, there is a very short period during the Upper Devonian into the Lur Carboniferous where we seem to get several basins within this larger carbonate platform that become anoxic, oxygen poor. And so that leads to the formation of uh, some very, very large scale black shale deposits. That's very, very organic rich shale. So, okay, so this is a slightly you know, higher resolution uh, I, you know, picture of what's going on during the Devonian. So here we go in the middle Devonian. We obviously have marine transgressions coming in from the west, the south and the east. And you can see by the late Devonian, nearly the entirety of America and a significant portion of Canada is underwater. And so during this period, what we have is we have a nice, warm, shallow sea, very clear water. And so during this time period, we have extensive carbonate deposition. 
by the early Mississippian, you can see once if we just flick, flick here, we can see we have a small marine regression. But you can see even by the early Mississippian, you can see most of the United States is still underwater. And a significant portion of Western Canada is also still underwater. So still large scale limestone formation going on. And as we're moving into the late Mississippian, that's the middle Carboniferous, we can see we have a full marine regression underway and the sea is now moving off the land and returning to the ocean basins. So Middle Devonian reef, de uh, reef development in Western Canada formed extensive petroleum reservoirs. So you have to remember within this carbonate platform here, this area here, there would have been literally hundreds of different reefs all you know orientated in different directions essentially and it would split up this carbonate flat platform into lots and lots of cells lots and lots essentially of chambers with you know reefs either side of them essentially separating them from the other chambers you know nearby and so in some cases these chambers would essentially act in isolation so as these reefs coalesced, essentially that, that would stop the easy movement of water around between these uh, between these carbonate uh, platforms and so in some cases, if the reef became extensive enough and continuous enough, it could, of course, separate off the body of water from the rest of the Epiric Sea. And of course, at that particular time, we had a relatively hot climate that led to a very, very extensive evaporation. And so that could mean in some areas, in some parts of the carbonate platform, we actually got the development of quite thick sequences of evaporites. So if we look at Go back to this diagram here you can see here's uh, the approximate position of the uh, williston basin okay so uh, this is what we're talking about here so in terms of the williston basin you can see it's this area here so you imagine this area gets separated by a reef coming around here well of course now you have an isolated body of water if there's if there's less water coming in than is being lost to evaporation that is going to start evaporating away and it's going to deposit a quite substantial sequence of evaporites so in this particular instance, the restricted basin that formed led to the de deposition of approximately 300 meters of evaporite minerals. That's a pretty substantial quantity of evaporites. In order to do that, you'd obviously have to evaporate away a very substantial quantity of, of seawater. And it, it was also very, very helpful because underneath these evaporites, you have several very organic rich mudstones. And when they were lithified, the organic material within them was essentially cooked. And that led to the formation of lots of oil and gas. That oil and gas would naturally rise because it's more because it's uh, more buoyant than the surrounding rock and water. So it naturally rises up, and it can only rise so far though because it gets trapped underneath this layer of evaporites that acts as a seal, so the oil and gas can't escape. And so we can then come along later and then pump out the oil and gas and make a fortune. So the evaporites themselves are also useful from an economic point of view because obviously you can mine them for salt, but of course you can also mine them for potash, essentially that's, pota that's potassium chloride, a mineral called sylvite, and you can take the mineral sylvite, which is potassium chloride, and through you know very simple chemistry you can liberate the potassium, which you can then use for fertilizers. So you know these evaporites that formed were you know extremely you know, helpful. So. As I also mentioned, during the Devonian, we have the formation of several pretty extensive bodies of black shale. So this is very, very interesting. So this means during the middle Devonian, we get the shift from chemical sedimentary rocks, so limestones, to clastic sedimentary rocks, shales. So all of a sudden we have a shift from you know uh, limestones to very mud dominated sediments. So this means clearly you need to have a, a source area for the mud appearing. Now if the source area had been there you know, all the time, then the area would have had a constant stream of clastic sediment coming into that area. But it doesn't. The clastic sediments suddenly appear almost out of nowhere. And so this means that wherever that clastic sediment was, was forming, essentially it must have appeared, you know, during the Kaskaskia sequence. It wasn't there right at the beginning. So the changes resulted from the formation of new source areas associated with mountain building during the Acadian orogeny. So what we get is we get, uh, we get some mountain building taking place in this area up here. That produces a substantial quantity of sediment that then is moved into these you know topographic lows in the Epiric Sea and for you know into these basins here and they begin to fill up with clastic sediment. 
Now we also have some additional high ground produced by the uh, Kagan orogeny down here. But of course we also have the existing high ground from the Taconic orogeny there as well. And so that also helps us apply sediment into these basins here. And so, you know, that explains where the clastic sediment comes from. That it also explains why it seems to come out of nowhere, because the Acadian highlands weren't there at the start of the Kaskaskia. As the Kaskaskia progressed, on the other hand, the Acadian highlands appeared, and that's the new source of sediment that was being deposited within these ocean basins. So at the end of the uh, Devonian, we have black shell units that are typically less than 10 meters thick. So, okay. They are not particularly uh, thick layers, and that's, nor that's probably because shales do not have a very rapid rate of accumulation. It takes a very, very long time to build up a substantial shale layer. So, you know, you shouldn't really expect, you know, huge thicknesses to have built up. So, uh, where we find these black shales, they are best developed proximal to the margins of the Appalachian Mobile Belt. However, we have many contemporaneous units occurring in the western United States and Canada. So you'll notice we have these basins down here which are filled with black shale. Now those are exp easily explained due to the erosion of uh, class due to the erosion of rocks that was occurring in the you know, proto Appalachians, the very early Appalachian mountains. But these basins up here in Canada and down here towards the uh, Texas New Mexico Mexico border are a little bit more difficult to explain. So in terms of the black shells themselves, they are non-calcareous, thinly bedded, and fossil poor. So non-calcareous, well, that would suggest that the high quantity of clastic sediment going into the system decreased the water quality, and the decreasing water quality meant that uh, essentially the, the you know, deposition of uh, calcium carbonate stopped because conditions were not optimal anymore for carbonate deposition. Now the fact they're thinly bedded suggests that the sediments were deposited slowly in a relatively still body of water and the fact they're fossil poor would suggest that there was very little oxygen around so it's just the environment was relatively anoxic oxygen you know nearly oxygen free so where present the fossil assemblage is microscopic and typically consists of condont so condonts are kind of tiny eel like creatures we have algae and we have plant spores and they indicate that the lower beds are late Devonian and the upper beds of these black shell sequences are early Carboniferous but we're not getting the types of you know uh, oxygen breathing life that we would expect to see in ocean basins so that would suggest that there was very little oxygen around so the origin of these black shells is a little bit uncertain but we know that their formation requires, number one, a reduced supply of coarse detrital sediment. So what we need is we need to get lots and lots of very fine detrital sediment into the area, because obviously shales are made from clay and silt-sized clasts. We need a lot of organic productivity. So we need lots and lots of essentially photosynthesizing algae in the seawater. Okay, then when those algae died, they, their bodies would float down and they would become incorporated into the, uh, the muds and the clays, into, sorry, into the silts and the clays, producing the very organic rich black shale. We also require undisturbed bottom waters. So we need the, the water at the bottom of the Epiric Sea in these areas here to be very, very still. And we need that because if the water at the bottom was, was you know, churned up quite a lot, well, it would mix with the overlying, more oxygen-rich water. What we want is we want a situation where the water at the bottom of these basins becomes very, very oxygen-poor. And that way, any photosynthesizing microorganisms that die and float down and become incorporated into the clays and silts of the seabed will not decompose. Okay, so that's what we need. So we essentially need a, we need anoxic waters at the bottom of these ocean basins. We need lots and lots of photosynthesizing algae floating around in the ocean. Okay, because we need lots of them to die to add organic material to our shale. And we also need a reduced supply of very coarse detrital sediments. We're talking sands to make sure that we end up with a shale rather than, of course, a sandstone. In terms of the uh, the sources for the sediment, well, it's a little bit complicated. You can see over here, we have the uh, the Appalachian Highlands. Now that would have supplied sediment to these basins here. 
This basin up here probably had sediment supplied by the erosion of the Canadian Shield up here. And when we're talking about this basin down here, that's a little bit more difficult to explain. There, we believe there would have been several small islands in that area, and they probably were the source for the sediment that went into this basin, but we're not 100% certain. What you'll notice, though, as you can see, when you look at this picture of the uh, of the seafloor of the uh, Kaskaskira Pyrrhic Sea, you'll see that it's not totally uh, flat. You'll notice there are several depressions associated with the seafloor, and these will have been the regions into which this clastic sediment will have you know, been focused. And the bottom waters in these little basins here essentially will have become anoxic, and that will have meant that all the organic, uh, all the blue algae that were living in the water here were when they died, their carcasses would float down to the bottom, be incorporated in with the clay and the silt to produce a very, very organic rich shale. So, as I said, the high productivity means that you have to have had substantial quantities of organic material raining onto the seafloor to be incorporated into the sediment. And as I also touched on already, we need that bottom water at the bottom of the basin to be anoxic, because if there was oxygen there, that would have meant decomposition would have taken place, and all the organic material would have been broken down by decomposers. Now, because it wasn't, that means the water at the bottom of the basin must have been very oxygen poor. So obviously that means any subsequent organic material entering that region will not decompose. Obviously, we need to make sure the water, bottom water stays oxygen poor, so it can't mix uh, well with any overlying water, which would have been, comparatively speaking, oxygen rich. And so obviously that means over time we have a buildup of organic material with our clay and silt sized clasts. Now, these black shells are actually quite helpful because they're a major source of hydrocarbons. They've been, they actually made oil when they were lithified, and we can go to them now and we can actually frack them to, uh, to extract oil and gas that way as well. And they're also, in some places, a, a host for substantial quantities of uranium as well. So these black shells are you know, very, very important. Okay, so we've been going for over 40 minutes, so it's time for another break. So let's stop here. So pause the presentation, get up, have a walk around, and come back in about five minutes, please. Okay, so what was happening towards the end of the Kaskaskia sequence? Well, quick aside, uh, it's worth mentioning that in the late Devonian, global temperatures decreased, and this led to the formation of alpine-type glaciers, so essentially these mountain glaciers, um, in the Acadian highlands, and they deposited uh, glacial sediments and you know, along the, in the coastal regions, and they also deposited uh, distal drop stones uh, in some areas of the Kaskaskia Sea. So if you remember, a drop stone is a piece of rock that falls out in the bottom of an iceberg as the iceberg melts. Okay, so anyway, uh, so back to the end of the Kaskaskia. So after the late Devonian to early Carboniferous black shales, uh, they stopped, they disappeared, they were replaced by carbonate sedimentation again. So clearly, you know, whatever was causing the black shales to form eventually ceased, and we returned to carbonate deposition. So the limestones that were being deposited contain lots and lots of uh, crinoid fossils. So crinoids essentially are organisms, you can kind of see one back here in this picture. You can see it has a, a single stem. Okay, there's the stem there. And you can see attached to the top of the stem is the bulb. And on the bulb you have several arms that come off. And the arms are covered in little uh, feather-like appendages. And the feather-like appendages catch the food pass them down the arm from one feather-like appendage to the other until it passes them down here. This is the area where you have the mouth essentially in the bulb here. So the food gets passed down the arms and it gets consumed here. So that's a, that's a crinoid and the, uh, the Kaskaskia uh, Sea, the Pyrrhic Sea, was absolutely stuffed with them. So uh, Kaskaskia um, uh, limestones are very uh, full of these crinoid fossils. There are also lots and lots of oolitic limestones. So if you remember, a oolid is a carbonate particle that looks a lot like a jawbreaker. And oolids can only form in relatively shallow water. And so this means that the Kaskaskia Sea must have been pretty shallow 
So there are other indicators that the Kaskaskia Sea was shallow. We have some limestones that show ripple marks. So that suggests the surface of the water is being churned up by waves, and that churning up of the water is affecting, you know, essentially uh, churning the sediment underneath and, and shaping it. We have cross bedding. Cross bedding tends to form just off the coast, once again in relatively shallow water. And we also have well sorted shell fragments. So well, well sorted shell fragments suggest that there's some kind of process going on that's essentially separating big pieces of shell from small pieces of shell. And the most common method of doing that is through waves. And so once again, that suggests we're in an, you know, in an environment where the water depth is not that great. So during the mid Carboniferous, the Kaskaskia Sea began to retreat and carbonate deposition in this shallow sea began to stop and then eventually began to slow down and then eventually stopped. So the carbonates were followed by substantial quantities of detrital marine sediments that were sourced from the eroding highlands along Laurentia's eastern and northern margin. So, you know, we have the classic regressive sequence. So we had carbonates, then as the water level uh, begins to uh, drop, they get replaced by mudstones, and then eventually the mudstones get replaced by sandstones as the sea level gets even lower, and then eventually over the top of the sandstones you have the essentially the, the formation of an erosional surface which represents exposed land which you could have walked on. So once the Kaskaskia Sea is fully retreated, well, North America, Laurentia is now fully exposed again, and so we have continent-wide erosion going on, which obviously produces a continent-wide unconformity. So this then brings us on to the Absaroka. So the Absaroka takes place uh, from the Lower Carboniferous into the Early Jurassic, so it goes on for quite a long time. So the Absaroka sequence was deposited over a very long period of time, uh, but we're just going to focus on the Paleozoic parts. So the unconformity between the Kaskaskia and the Absaroka marks a change from essentially the Mississippian to the Pennsylvanian in North America. It's called Mississippian and Pennsylvania in North America, uh, or to me, it's simply the boundary between the lower and upper Carboniferous. So the Absaroka sequence is noticeably different to the Kaskaskia sequence due to the differences in the tectonic regime and the sediments that that tectonic regime created. So this is our situation that we have during the Absaroka. You can see a very large proportion of Laurentia is above sea level. So it's open and therefore it's being eroded, producing clastic sediments. We have essentially the Appalachian Mountains forming down here, along here. We have the Achetan Mountains forming over here. We have the Antler Highlands over here. And we have the Ancestral Rockies forming here. And so what this means is, is you have lots and lots of areas of the crust that are above sea level, and are therefore being actively eroded, producing clastic sediment. And so this means that the water of the Absaroka Sea was a lot cloudier you know, than it would have been in either the Soak the Tippecanoe, or the Kaskaskia. And so this means that carbonate deposition during the Absaroka transgression was actually very, very limited. Most of the sediments we're going to get deposited during this marine sequence are going to be clastic, lots of mudstones, lots of sandstones. So this is our situation during the Lake Carboniferous. You can see here's our marine transgression going on here. So this is the formation of the Absaroka Epiric. So you can see we have all of this crust exposed here, producing sediments which are going to be deposited into this sea. We also have all of this high ground over here that are going to be actively, that's going to be actively eroded, once again producing sediment that's going to be deposited into this sea. And you can see by the early Permian, this body of water is in full retreat. And you know, from that point on, it just retreats back out into the ocean. So as you can see, the Absaroka was not actually a particularly huge marine transgression. It only covered, you know, granted it covered a substantial portion of the United States, but in terms of Canada and Greenland, they remained completely above sea level, creating lots and lots of detrital sediment, which is being deposited into this basin here. So... Uh, this, this is the particular time when we begin to see large-scale coal formation. So along the margins of the 
uh, Carboniferous, along the margins of the Absaroka Sea here, we begin to see the formation of very, very large coal deposits. So coal deposits are typically found within a sequence of rocks which we refer to as a cyclotherm. So cyclotherms are repetitive patterns of marine and non-marine sediments that are common in upper Carboniferous strata, so Pennsylvanian aged strata. So they are the result of the interplay between non-marine deltaic deposits and shallow marine interdeltaic and shelf environments. So essentially what you have is a sequence of rocks that represents the coastline and then very, very shallow seawater and then slightly deeper seawater. And you have these constant cycles where the water depth goes up, water depth goes down, water depth goes up, water depth goes down. And you can see that in the rock record. So the initial lowest units are a mixture of deltaic and fluvial deposits. So you have a mixture of terrestrial and intermediate environments. So clearly the surface is, a, is above sea level. And these deposits are then overlain by something which is referred to as the underclay. And the underclay commonly contains root casts of plants, essentially big plants like trees. And essentially, these are the organic, this is organic material that makes up the overlying coal there. So the underclay essentially represents the fine muddy sediments that are being deposited in a swampy environment. So you have a sequence now going from essentially uh, terrestrial sediments, essentially being deposited above sea level. Now you have a shift to a swampy environment, so the area is now being partially inundated. The ground is being essentially covered over by the sea, but not very much. It's turning the area swampy. And within these swampy environments, you have you know, a very warm climate, so you have the formation of lots and lots of trees, and these trees and other you know, plants are going to die, and when they die, they're going to fall over into the water, where they're going to form a layer of organic material, which will become the clay layer. Uh, sorry, the clay layer, the coal layer. So you can kind of see this, you've seen this picture already. These are the, are the general regions in which we get very large scale coal formation taking place. Obviously we have the Pennsylvania region, that's a you know quite an obvious one, but we also have a large area of Western Europe also undergoes sporadic inundation creating these cyclotherms as well. So the coal bed is of course uh, formed by the buildup of organic, so plant material into this swampy water. And of course, as we've discussed, uh, in order for this build up to take place, the coal, the organic material cannot decompose. And so this means that the, uh, the environment has to be relatively oxygen poor. Now, over the top of the, the coal beds, we typically have a sequence of marine carbonates and mudstones, typically with very, very abundant marine invertebrate fossils. And so this is very, very important because this tells us now our swampy area has been covered over by the ocean. So we're now underwater, we're under seawater. And so that would explain why we start seeing the formation of limestones and shales over the top. And then eventually this sequence ends, the sequence of marine sediments ends with an erosional surface. And when we see the erosional surface, well, that tells us that what's happened is we're now back above sea level. The sediments are now exposed and they're being actively eroded, producing the erosional surface. And then the cycle is going to repeat itself again. So you get one on cycle, one cycle on top of another, on top of another. So this diagram here kind of shows you the general cycle. You can see at the bottom here, we have these uh, terrestrial sediments. So we're above sea level. As we move up through the sequence, we get the underclay here and the cold sequence. So this is representing essentially the area becoming swampy, whereas the coal layer is going to represent the buildup of organic material within that swampy environment. Then we see the coal seam is covered over by a sequence of marine shales. So that's telling us we're getting essentially muddy clastic sediments being deposited over the top. Then as the water depth gets even deeper, we get the deposition of limestones. And then we see a steady decrease in the amount of limestone, a steady increase in the amount of mudstone. And that tells us the sea level is getting shallower again. So if we look at it in this graph over here, we can see we have essentially increasing sea levels and then we reach a peak, and then the sea level drops again in this coastal region. And it's this portion here, essentially, where you have the coastline partially inundated, creating very swampy conditions that leads to the formation of these you know, very plant-rich swamp environments within which you can form very, very large-scale 
coal beds. And this sequence didn't just occur once, it occurred several times. So you'll have one layer of coal on top of another, on top of another. So you'll have substantial quantities building up over time. So the cyclotherms, I say, represent transgressive and regressive sequences. So the sea level is going up and then the sea level is going back down. Now, because uh, because of the fact that they're separated by erosional surface, typically the you get the transgressive portion of the sequence is preserved quite well. Okay, so if you go back to this diagram here, normally this sequence of the sediment here is preserved quite nicely. However, because this sediment here, this portion of the sequence here is exposed at the top of the sequence, this portion can very often be lost to uh, lost uh, due to erosion. And so this uh, regressive portion of the cycle can be missing in a lot of cases. So when you know when we drop back above sea level, when we come back above sea level, and we have the period of erosion, this material up here can be eroded away and lost. So sometimes this portion, this upper regressive portion of the sequence, can be missing. So uh, the regressive portion of the sequence uh, typically goes from carbonates to uh, very muddy sediments. And then it will eventually, in some cases, grade into intermediate mudstone. So we've gone from marine environments into this kind of semi-marine, semi-terrestrial environment. And as I said, portions of the sequence can be missing depending on the degree of erosion that occurred between each cyclotherm. So a nice example of a modern cyclotherm environment is the Florida Everglades. So the Florida Everglades is an area of Florida that's partially inundated, so the sea level is high enough, so this area has been essentially saturated by seawater. It's got a very swampy environment. And as you can see from this picture, you can see it's a very uh, plant life rich area. So when, when is all this plant life, when it dies, it's falling into the water, decomposing in the water, using up the oxygen. And of course, that means the water in this area is very, very anoxic. And if you've ever been to the Florida Everglades, you might know that it does have quite a how can I put this, funky odor to it. You know, it doesn't smell, you know, it has a distinct odor to it, which tells you that, you know, there's something interesting going on under the water. So that's, you know, that gives you some idea that, you know, things aren't decomposing properly. It has a very distinct odor, you know, kind of a, a very kind of, you know, strange odor yeah anyway so i'm getting i'm going off on a tangent here anyway nevertheless so we have a buildup of organic material in this you know oxygen poor water so we're building up a layer of organic material at the bottom of the uh florida everglades here and that will eventually become a layer of coal so what's going to happen is eventually the sea level is going to rise this area is going to be inundated Initially, we're going to get a layer of muds deposited over the top. So we're going to get deposit over the top. So we're going to get this, this area is going to be covered in mudstones. And then as the water depth gets even deeper, this area is then going to get covered by a layer of limestones, carbonates. And then eventually the sea level is going to drop. We're going to return to mudstones. And then we're going to get to a point where this, this area is now back above sea level, exposed. And once again, it will be swampy, and so we'll get you know the formation of a new swamp environment, and a new layer of coal will begin forming. So, if you've ever been to Florida, you'll know that the area is surprisingly flat, and only a very minor change in sea level would be sufficient to begin to significantly inundate the Florida Everglades area. So, you know, these cyclotherms can be achieved through just very, very minor changes in sea level, and those kind of minor changes can be caused by, you know, very, very minor glacial advances and glacial retreats. You know, and as we know, during this period, we had very, very large glaciers uh, on Gondwana over the South Pole. And so the retreat and expansion of these glaciers will have had significant effects on global sea level, making them go up and down, depending on whether the glacier is expanding or melting. So as I said, the best explanation for these widespread sea level changes in the upper Carboniferous is the advance and retreat of the Gondwan and glaciers. And late Paleozoic cyclotherm activity would seem to correlate well with the Gondwan and glacial cycle. So it, you know, there would appear to be reasonable evidence to suggest that's the cause of these changing sea levels. Okay, so it's been an hour, so another good place to stop, so pause the presentation here, uh, get up, walk around, have a glass of water, and then please come back in five minutes. So, during the late Absaroka, 
uh, we see deformation in the southwestern portion of Laurentia began to cause the uplift of some very, very big fault bound blocks of uh, essentially crust. So what we're talking about here is talking about pieces of crust, chunks of crust that have faults uh, on all sides and the area starts to be compressed, it starts to be squished. And you know, if you imagine taking a, a big clump of, you know, something like silly putty, holding it in the palm of your hand and squeezing it really, really tightly, the silly putty is going to squeeze out in between your fingers. And it's the same thing happening essentially as you compress the crust, these big blocks of rock essentially get squeezed upwards and they move up along the faults and uh, they get pushed to, uh, further up so they cause topographic highs. And these are going to produce what we refer to as the ancestral Rockies. So uplift produced mountains that were up to about two kilometers high and erosion of the Paleozoic sequences and exposure of the underlying Precambrian crust. So what happens is when the crust gets pushed up, all the Paleozoic rocks that have been deposited, so all the rocks from the Silurian, the Ordovician, the Cambrian, they all get eroded away and we get the exposure of the underlying Precambrian rocks. Now, this erosion of all this Paleozoic uh, sediments uh, produced substantial quantities of detrital sediments that were deposited into the proximal basins, i.e. they were deposited in the Absaroka Epiric Sea. So the formation of the ancestral Rockies is currently thought to be due to the subduction along Laurentia's western margin and the collision of Laurasia and Gondwana along the Achetan Mobile Belt. And this formed significant crustal stresses in southwestern Laurasia, which were relieved through faulting, deformation, and the formation of and the formation of the ancestral rockies. Sorry about that blip though, I went and pressed the wrong button at the wrong time. That was what that was completely on me. I'm sorry about that. So this is our situation. So here we are in the early Triassic. We can see we have the collision of Gondwana here along, along what is now the modern eastern seaboard. And we also have the collision of Gondwana, which took place down here in what is the Achetan Mobile Belt. So there's Texas, you know, uh, Arkansas and Oklahoma, this area here. OK, now this collision will have imparted lots of stresses into the crust in this area here. And these compressional stresses will have been accommodated through uh, the formation of lots of faults. And as the crust here gets compressed and squished, essentially it begins to force up these blocks and you can kind of see here as well we have a subduction zone running along the western coast here that means you're going to get compressional forces not only coming from the southeast here but they're also going to be coming in from the west due to the subduction occurring along the what is now the modern west coast and so this is going to focus all of these stresses into this area you've got forces coming from this direction forces coming from this direction and all of it's essentially going to combine and you know hit each other in this region here. And so this area here is going to be under substantial quantities of compressional stress, which is going to lead to the formation of lots of faulting, and that's going to help to push up these blocks of rock. So this is our situation here. Essentially what we end up doing is we end up forming lots and lots of very steep faults. Okay, most of them are, are normal faults. And as the area gets compressed, the blocks of rock essentially in between these two faults are you know constantly get pushed upwards creating topographic highs so here we go so this is the garden of the gods here this is in uh, colorado and what you're seeing here is you're seeing blocks of precambrian crust that have been pushed upwards now what's happened is, is the paleozoic rocks that they were pushed up into have been eroded away but the precambrian rock consists mostly of granite it's much harder it erodes much more slowly and so it's end up forming these topographic highs here. And so, you know, this is essentially, you know, what you can see going on here. We have these blocks of Precambrian crust like this area here being pushed upwards into the Paleozoic rocks. These Paleozoic rocks here, of course, then get eroded away, leaving these topographic highs consisting of these Precambrian granites and gneisses. And so that's the very, very, very first stage of the formation of the Rocky Mountains taking place there. So, okay, so back to the Absaroka. So the Absaroka Epiric Sea began to retreat in the late Carboniferous, not long after the transgression had begun. So it, was, it wasn't a particularly, you know, expansive sea. And once it reached its maximum, 
it very quickly went into retreat. Now, it was a very slow transgression, and it was a very slow regression. So this retreat wasn't fast. It took place over a very long period of time. So by the early Permian, the sea occupied a stretch from Nebraska to western Texas. And by the middle Permian, the sea was limited to southwestern New Mexico and western Texas. Essentially, from that, by that point, nearly everywhere else that had been underwater was back above sea level and was exposed. So we get the formation of uh, thick evaporites in Kansas and Oklahoma, and they indicate that the Absaroka Sea was becoming restricted in places. And so, of course, if you remember, restricted bodies of water in an arid environment lead to large-scale evaporation and can lead to the deposition of evaporites. And so that's telling us that by this point, by this middle Permian, we have bodies of water becoming isolated, evaporating away, and producing large-scale evaporite deposits. So in the southwest, so down here, the Absaroka Sea of the Middle Permian formed three basins separated by two platforms. A platform is in the an area of raised seafloor. And so what we have here is we ended up forming the Midland Basin, the Delaware Basin, and over here we have the uh, Martha Basin. And what happens is, is we ended up getting the formation of reefs along the margins of these basins and these reefs were near continuous and essentially what we end up with is one two three isolated bodies of water which obviously began to evaporate away producing large-scale evaporite deposits okay and of course these evaporites are very very important especially in texas because once again just like the ones in canada they actually form the seal that traps in the oil and gas that's in the permian basin of, of western texas and so you know the formation of these three basins is extremely important because that's where a lot of texas's oil wealth is located on land so here we go so this kind of is a blow up of the uh the 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 good quality diagrams we've seen earlier. So by the end of the Permian, we see the Absaroka Sea retreating, and these are our three basins here. Okay, so what we've got is this entire body of water is essentially becoming a uh, an isolated uh, body, and it's all evaporating away. So this entire area is having large quantities of evaporites being deposited, but it's especially effective in this area here, where we form these three isolated basins, basins ringed by these reefs, and you know they form substantial quantities of evaporites. In terms of the continent itself, well as the continent gets exposed we form large quantities of red sandstones over a lot of North America and a lot of Europe for that measure as well. Once again indicating that the, the climate is pretty hot and dry. So okay, so now we've gone over the two sequences, now we have to start thinking about the mobile belts, the erogenies. So during so during the Neo Proterozoic, so that's the late Proterozoic and early Paleozoic, Laurentia's western margin, essentially what is now the west coast, should I west coast, should I say, was mo was mostly passive. There's pretty much nothing of interest really going on. So during the late Devonian to early Carboniferous, we have several island arcs moving eastwards towards what is now the modern day west coast and of course they eventually crashed into the west coast of Laurentia and they produced what is referred to as the antler orogeny and you can see it's located here there it is there so during this time tectonics along the west coast were actually quite complex there were lots of numerous there were lots of subduction zones in that area they, they tended to be quite short and some subduction zones were subducting to the west some subduction zones were subducting to the east it was a an area of very very complex you know plate tectonics and essentially what we end up with uh, is a, it eventually caused a basin to form uh, that essentially was sitting off the uh, west coast of Laurentia and what happens is is on one side of the basin we have essentially a, a sequence we have a, you know, a sequence of we have an island arc sequence we have the west coast of Laurentia over here and we have an ocean basin in between and eventually the closure essentially subduction of crust pulls, pushes this island arc towards the west coast of Laurentia that obviously pushes up this sequence of sediments and, and, and uh, crustal rocks here up onto the west coast of Laurentia, producing the Antler Highlands. 
So it's a relatively straightforward situation, but the tectonics in the area is very, very complicated. But, it, you know, based on what, you know, depending on, you know, what's happening, some models say the area is sub, is, the crust is subducting to the west, some models suggest the crust is subducting to the east. In the grand scale of things, it doesn't really matter too much. The moral of the story is that we end up with this very, very small set of mountains, which we refer to as the Antler Highlands. And that's pretty much it in terms of orogenic events occurring on the west coast until we make it to the Mesozoic. Now, along the south coast of Laurentia, we have the Achetan orogeny. And as I've already pointed out, this, this, this is focused mostly in Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Texas. And Essentially, once again, this area was passive from the Neo-Proterozoic, so the late Proterozoic, all the way through to the early Carboniferous. Pretty much nothing was going on. Now, what happens then is, of course, uh, Gondwana is moving very, very close to uh, Laurasia at that point, and the compressive forces produced by that impending collision begins to deform what is now modern-day Texas, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. So uh, it's a, in the early Devonian, the oceanic crust between Laurasia and Gondwana began to subduct under uh, under Gondwana, and essentially it's subducting under Gondwana's northwestern coast. So that starts to pull Laurasia down to the southeast, and the two mass the two land masses eventually hit in the early Carboniferous, and the collision continued through the Carboniferous into the Permian, and this collision essentially resulted in large scale uh, stresses. They were accommodated by large-scale thrusting and folding, and that produced the Achetan mobile belt in the Achetan mountains. So here's our basic situation. This was the south coast of Laurentia. It was a passive margin, pretty much like it is now, in fact. And obviously, Gondwana is going to come from the southeast, move towards the northwest, and eventually there's going to be a collision. And so all this oceanic crust here is going to subduct down underneath Gondwana. And the resulting collision is obviously going to produce the uh, the the Achetan Mountains here. And the Achetan Mountains are going to consist of a mixture of continental crust, marine sediments, and also rocks from the volcanic island arcs here as well. Okay, so now let's move on to the big one, the Appalachian Mobile Belt. So the Appalachian Mobile Belt is the result of four distinct orogenic events. We have the Taconic Orogeny, which we already discussed. We have the Acadian Orogeny, which we've already touched on. We have the Achetan Orogeny, which we discussed in the previous slide. And then the final one is the uh, Allegahinian Orogeny. Now that one we haven't really discussed yet. So the Taconic Orogeny we've pretty much dealt with. It was due to the collision of the what is now the modern day east coast with several island arcs. That was a pretty boring Orogeny, you know, pretty dull in the grand scale of things. So, um, we're going to forget the Taconic Orogeny, and that was then followed by, of course, the collision of Laurentia with Baltica. And, of course, the, the initial collision started in the north, and that led to the Caledonian Orogeny. And then as the collision progressed in a southerly direction, eventually the southern part of Baltica, that includes Avalonia, made contact with Laurentia, and that produced the Acadian Orogeny. And as I said, that was focused mostly in the in, the, in modern-day Newfoundland down to New England, that kind of area, and that led and that was mostly driven by this imp this impact of the southern margin of Baltica onto Laurentia. Now, as I said, some of the uh, the stresses caused by that uh, impact uh, not only resulted in compressional tectonics, which produced the you know the Acadian mountains, the Acadian uh, highlands. It also led to uh, shear forces, and that produced uh, some large strike slip faults, uh, large transform faults, and that helped to transfer some of the stresses further down the eastern seaboard. Okay, so although the main impact occurred in an area between Newfoundland and New England, the forces of the impact were transferred down the, uh, the eastern seaboard down towards Georgia. So essentially the Arcadian orogeny represents the second stage of the formation of the Appalachian Mobile Belt. And uh, as I said, it began in, the middle Devo it began in the early to middle Devonian when this crash between Laurentia and Baltica uh, was finally finishing. It concluded in the late Devonian. So the Acadian orogeny produced the Acadian highlands along Laurentia's eastern margin. And so stresses from this collision were, transfer were transferred along the modern east coast by several strike slip faults. And that produced deformation away from the main point of contact where the main impact occurred. 
So the situation was further complicated by the collision of several volcanic island arcs onto the modern east coast at approximately the same time, and both of that, you know, so the collision, the the uh, the shearing, the, the strike slip faulting, and the collision of these island arcs makes the Acadian orogeny a very very complex orogeny. It's quite a quite a mess, in fact. So as the closure of the southern portion of the Aptis Ocean took longer than the northern portion, so the northern portion, if you remember, is the Caledonian orogeny, the Acadian orogeny did not conclude until the late Devonian, so it's been dated to around 360 to 410 million years ago, give or take a little bit. So in terms of the collision itself, it forced marine sedimentary rocks from the floor of the Aptis Ocean over onto the, uh, the crust of, the, of Laurentia, essentially in a northwesterly direction, producing the uh, the Caledonian Highlands, sorry, the Acadian Highlands, my apologies. And obviously then once all these rocks were exposed, obviously we then had large-scale erosion taking place, and that produced large quantities of clastic sediments, which of course formed the old red sandstones of Europe, which was of course Baltica at that time, and the Catskill Delta of Laurentia, obviously now modern day North America. And these uh, clastic rocks are quite red in color, suggesting that they were deposited into an arid or semi-arid environment. The Catskill Delta itself uh, thins from a maximum thickness of three kilometers right here next to the mountain range, down to about 100, down to about 100 meters, you know, a lot further away. And essentially a, a corresponding 1.1 uh, thick uh, clastic wedge called the Old Red Sandstone formed over here in Europe and essentially a very very large quantity of rock had to be eroded to produce these two very very large bodies of clastic sedimentary rock so you know this mountain range must have been pretty substantial we're probably looking somewhere about the size of the Rockies probably so here's our situation so here's the Caledonian Highlands produced by the impact of the northern portion of Baltica with Laurentia and we have the Taconic Highlands down here produced by the collision of uh, the what is now the modern day east coast with several smaller island arcs and then the collision of Baltica is not going to be complete though because this southern portion still hasn't made full contact with Laurentia okay so eventually it does make full contact this part here actually actually comes whacking into this area which essentially is which covers the area between you know Newfoundland and New England so it covers this entire area here so this impact of this southern portion of Baltica here causes this entire area of crust to be deformed in a northwesterly direction. Some of the stresses from this impact get transferred down along the east coast by strike slip faults. And then as you can see, we have a subduction zone here associated with Gondwana, which is this piece of crust down here. We have several volcanic island arcs here, okay, being produced by the oceanic crust subducting beneath Gondwana. And by the time we make it to the point where we have the Acadian orogeny going on, it just so happens that at the same time, the first of these volcanic island arcs starts to make contact with the modern day east coast. And that's helping to add additional complexity to the Acadian orogeny. So the Acadian orogeny is a mixture of compressional tectonics caused by this collision between uh, Laurent Laurentia and Baltica. Strike slip tectonics, so transform tectonics produced by essentially stresses being moved down along the eastern seaboard. And then on top of that, we have the collision of the eastern seaboard with these volcanic island arcs. So it's a real mess. By the time we make it into the late Devonian, what's happening? Well, by the late Devonian, things have pretty much come to a complete stop. Okay, the collision between the southern portion of Baltica and uh, Laurentia has stopped. Has, has stopped so the compressive forces have gone so that means the strike slip forces have gone so there's no more transform forces taking moving material down the down the east coast but of course by this point what's happening well as we can see Gondwana land Gondwana is now extremely close to uh, Laurentia Laurentia should I say by this point and the impending collision is going to start stressing the uh, the crust right here so even before Gondwana actually Gondwana proper actually makes contact with Laurasia this area would already be undergoing extensive deformation just by you know, the, these preliminary forces as this as these two massive pieces of crust head towards each other <laughs> 
So the achetonerogeny we've already touched on, so that's going to occur down here in the southern region. So there's Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas. And you can see we have there's a, a sequence of volcanic islands that are there are they're out in front of the, the coast of Gondwana, and they're actually going to make contact here before the main body of Gondwana does. So the, the start of the achetonerogeny is actually going to be the impact of these volcanic island arcs here with the continental crust of Laurentia, Laurentia, shall I say, here. So the main phase uh, of the Achetonerogeny occurred when what is now modern-day South America hit the south coast of Laurasia. So if you actually look quite carefully here, this is modern-day South America just down here. And it's going to come up this way, and eventually it's going to make contact with what is now you know, Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas. Okay. So this occurred contemporaneously with the east coast of Laurasia making contact with Africa, which of course was also part of, part of Gondwana. Okay, so when this uh, portion of South America, well, which is part of Gondwana at the time, makes contact with North America or Laurentia, that's going to be the Achetonerogeny. And at the same time, we have this area here, which is essentially modern day uh, northwestern Africa is going to be hitting the eastern seaboard at the, you know, exactly the same time as the Achetan Erogeny is taking place. And that impact between modern-day Africa and the North, and North America is going to give us the Elegahenian Erogeny. So the Elegahenian Erogeny uh, began in the early to middle Carboniferous. And initially, we have several uh, volcanic island arcs accreting onto Laurentia's east coast. So the, the start of it was the collision of all of these little volcanic island arcs with the eastern coast of Laurasia. So that's the start. And then obviously, as Gondwana moves towards uh, Laurentia, Laurasia, obviously all of these marine sediments in between them are going to start being compacted and squished, and they're going to be thrust and fo folded and thrust onto the continents. That's going to start producing the mountain range. So the Achetan and Hercynian orogenies were finished by the early Permian. Oh, sorry, missed a point there. So um, this, this collision of the east coast of North America with these volcanic island arcs was followed by the main collision between Laurasia and Gondwana in the middle Carboniferous, and that led to the suturing together, the locking together of these two pieces of continental crust, producing the supercontinent Pangaea. So the Achetan and Hercynian orogenies were finished by the early Permian. However, the Elgahenian orogeny uh, marked the main point of contact, so this collision took a little bit longer to finish. It probably wasn't done until the late Permian. And essentially these three orogenies combined formed a continuous mountain chain, a bit like the mountain chain we have now that goes from the Alps, essentially goes from the Alps through the Zagros Mountains of Iran all the way into the Himalayas of northern India. So that's a you know a mountain chain of a similar scale to the one that would have formed. In the case of this, we have the Hassinian mobile belt here, the essentially the Appalachian mobile belt here, and the Achetan mobile belt here. It's a very extensive mountain range. So think of the modern day, you know, the modern day Alps going from essentially, you know, where you have Spain, France, Italy all kind of meeting up in southern Europe, going all the way along the south coast of Europe into, you know, through Turkey into Iran, and then, you know, down uh, through Pakistan into India. That's an equal sized, you know, mountain range there. And this, you know, this mountain range that's formed here would have been absolutely huge. We're talking Himalayan in kind of size. It would have been absolutely massive. So that's the early Carboniferous. So by the time we make it into the late Carboniferous, we can see we've got full contact now. We've got the uh, the full contact now between what is modern day northwestern Africa, which is here, and North America, and we have full contact now between what is now modern day northern South America, and what is now the southern states of the U.S. at present day. Okay. Now you can see this is where the main part of the impact is taking place. So this is where the main impact continues for longest. These areas here, the Hassinian orogeny and the Achetan orogeny, they finish a little bit earlier, typically in the early Permian, whereas the Elegahenian orogeny doesn't really finish until the late Permian. So by the early Permian, the Achetan orogeny has pretty much stopped. The Hassinian orogeny has pretty much stopped. 
and there's still a little bit of movement that will be going on uh, in the Appalachian mobile belt, this region here, but it's not going to be huge. It's still going to be going on just a little bit, but not a, a huge amount. Now you can see at this point, you know, this the substantial mountain range we had during the late Carboniferous has already begun to erode down because obviously once the mountain building event stops, you have, all you have is a, a, a essentially an exposed area of crust which is going to be eroded down very, very quickly, producing large quantities of sediments that are going to be spread out over Laurasia and Gondwana. Okay. So that's the end of the presentation. So uh, the code word of this presentation is tea, as in the thing British people like to drink. You know, just to give you a slight hint, you know, it might give you an idea of what's next to me on my uh, on my office desk uh, right now. Um, anyway, so uh, thank you for the uh, launch the presentation. I know it was a bit of a dull one, but uh, don't worry, the next one's going to be more interesting because the next one is going to be dealing with life in the Paleozoic, which is quite good fun. Okay, so take care and keep an eye out for the next presentation.